Greetings to everyone. Welcome back once again to this educational channel on biology. I'm teacher Janet. It's already the end of the school term, coming to the end of the school term, but let us continue to persevere and study the final chapters of biology from four syllabus. All right. So in this subtopic of 14.1, we're going to discuss the types of skeletons. Now looking at the organisms that can be found in the world today, do you know that there are three main types of skeletons that exist in the organisms? So for lobsters, crabs and prawns and also insects, these organisms have exoskeletons, whereas humans and other vertebrates like fishes and birds and uh, reptiles have endoskeletons. Now how about these two organisms here? What is this organism? It is like a snail, but it does not have a shell. This is called a slug. All right, we will find out more about it afterwards. So the slug, S-L-U-G, and the jellyfish have any skeletons or not? Yes, they do have. They have the, the hydrostatic skeletons. Okay, so let's find out more about the characteristics of the three types of skeletons so that we'll be able to identify what an organism has, what type of skeleton an organism has. The learning standards are as follows. 14.1 types of skeletons. Firstly, we should be able to list the types of skeletons in humans and animals. And these three types of skeletons are the hydrostatic skeleton, the exoskeleton, and the endoskeleton. Secondly, we should be able to justify the necessity of skeletons in humans and animals. What are the roles played by the skeletons in humans and animals? So among all the different organisms, there are three main types of skeletons, namely, number one, the hydrostatic skeleton, which is made of a fluid, fluid-filled cavity that's filled with fluid, right, that's under pressure. And then there's the exoskeleton, the, ex the word exo means external skeleton, and then there's the endoskeleton, endo means internal. Okay, so it's an internal skeleton. Let's start off by discussing the hydrostatic skeleton. So the word hydro has to do with some fluid or water. So this type of skeleton is quite a primitive skeleton. There are no hard parts in the skeleton, right? It's just soft body tissues and some fluid inside them. So this type of skeleton is found in the invertebrates, that is organisms without the backbone, such as the earthworm, the leech, which is a blood sucking organism, in Malay we call it linta, the slug. So the slug is like a snail without a home, without a shell, right? And uh, it's just made up of soft body parts, uh, soft body tissues, so it'll just crawl slowly on the floor. So uh, then we have the jellyfish that lives in the water, seawater, and we have hydra species, also a water organism that's very tiny. So all these organisms have the hydrostatic skeleton, which consists of a body cavity filled with fluid, which is under pressure and enclosed in compartments. Okay, so for example, the, the earthworm has many segments, and each segment is like a closed compartment, and it contains fluid in the center part of the body. This fluid is under pressure because the fluid is surrounded by a muscular wall with muscles in the wall, so how does movement occur? Now the cavity is surrounded, the fluid filled cavity is surrounded by muscles, right? So these muscles can contract to change the shape of the compartment. And as it contracts, the fluid will move in the compartment and the shape of the compartment will change. So if the fluid moves forward in the, the earthworm, then you'll see the whole body of the earthworm moving forward. Okay, so it's the muscles that contract to change the shape of the fluid filled compartments and that causes movement to occur. Now the disadvantage of this hydrostatic skeleton is that it is soft and it cannot protect the internal organs because there are no hard parts in this hydrostatic skeleton. It's made of fluid. So it does provide some support and enable locomotion. All right, so we are going to study more about the locomotion or movement in the earthworm later on. 
So let's look at the cross section of, of an earthworm. Now we'll be studying the movement of the earthworm later on. Okay, so this is just an introduction. Now to cut through the body of an earthworm, you will find that it has a few layers of muscles, and then in the center there is a hollow cavity. Okay, so start up with the epidermis, which is the outermost layer. Then you have a layer of muscles called the circular muscles, and then the next layer are the longitudinal muscles. Right? So these muscles can contract and relax. And they are antagonistic in nature, meaning that one, when one contracts, the other will relax. Right? And they have different effects on the body shape. Then this blue part is the fluid filled cavity, and inside in the center are the intestines, okay, the, the digestive tract. So basically, the earthworm's body consists of a muscular wall containing the circular and longitudinal muscle. And in the center, there is a body cavity filled with fluid. So when these muscles contract, they squeeze the fluid or press on the fluid. And the fluid will move uh, forward, for example, all right? And uh, it will cause the earthworm to move forward, okay? So we'll find out more about the movement of the earthworm in another subtopic. The second type of skeleton is called the exoskeleton. So exo means on the outside, okay, the external part of the body. So the exoskeleton is found in two types of organisms. The first type are the arthropods. Now what are arthropods? They are the organisms with segmented bodies and legs, such as the ant. All right, you can see that its body is divided into the head, the thorax and the abdomen, and even the abdomen itself is segmented. It has many uh, parts, all right? It's divided into many parts, and so are the legs. They are also segmented. So arthropods include the insects and the crustaceans such as prawns, crabs, and lobsters, right? So all these also have segmented body parts. So they all have uh, an outer covering called the exoskeleton, all right? Now, another group of organisms with the exoskeleton are the mollusks. So, think of snails when you think of mollusks, okay? So, mollusks have soft bodies on the inside, but they have shells. They have hard shells, okay? And they live inside these shells. So, uh, for the snail, it does come out of the shell, but when it uh, is sleeping, it will just withdraw into its shell, right? So, it can move out of the shell and uh, crawl around. Now, so mollusks includes, uh, include the snails, clams, oysters, and the scallops, and so forth, right? So they also have the hard, very hard outer covering called the shell, right? Now, so the definition for an exoskeleton is that it is a rigid outer covering made up of different materials depending on the type of organism. For insects, they con their Exoskeleton contain chitin, a type of polysaccharide which we have studied in chapter 4. Alright, it's a tough polysaccharide. And protein. So, the exoskeleton in insects is actually sometimes called the cuticle and it contains chitin and protein. Okay, now for crabs, prawns, and uh, the sea animals, uh, like they're called the crustaceans, they have a very hard shell. So, the composition of this shell in the crab, for example, is made up of uh, it is made up of chitin and calcium carbonate, which adds to the hardness of the shell. Right? It's, it still has chitin plus calcium carbonate. Whereas for mollusks, their shell is mainly calcium carbonate. All right, made up of calcium carbonate. So we know that if we collect these shells uh, and keep it, keep it. Uh, store it, it will still be the same after many, many years because the calcium carbonate doesn't uh, decompose, right? And the shell is still very hard. Okay, even you can keep it for many years. So the soft body tissues are on the inside, are in, inside the exoskeleton, attached to the exoskeleton, right? Now, the disadvantage of the exoskeleton for insects the, the exoskeleton or cuticle is non-living. It doesn't grow with the young insect. So from time to time, as the insect is growing and the soft tissues are becoming more and more, the body is, get, is uh, growing longer, 
it has to shed this exoskeleton. It has to come out of the old exoskeleton as seen here for the dragonfly. The brown one is the old exoskeleton. And then it has a it is replaced with a newer, larger ex exoskeleton. All right. So the process of uh, ecdesis, which is the shedding of the old exoskeleton to replace it with a new exoskeleton as the insect is growing, will be studied in chapter 15. All right. Now, this is to allow the growth of the body tissues, okay, ecdesis, which is the shedding of the old exoskeleton and replacing it with a new one. Let's see how movement occurs in animals with exoskeletons. Take the example of a grasshopper. So in the grasshopper, the skeleton, the exoskeleton has many joints. For example, at these points here, right, where the hard parts of the exoskeleton meet, all right? So when the muscles attached to the inner parts contract, they will pull parts of the exoskeleton so that the limbs, like the leg, will bend or straighten at the joints and this is how movement occurs okay for example inside the this grasshopper's leg you can see the extensor muscle which straightens the leg and the flexor muscle bends the leg at, at uh, causes the leg to bend uh, at this joint here so the extensor muscle for example in the straightening of the leg uh, this big extensor muscle will contract and pull this part of the exoskeleton so it will straighten this leg here all right, so that the grasshopper can hop. All right, so we'll discuss the movement of the grasshopper, the hopping action of the grasshopper in another subtopic. Now, let's talk about the third type of skeleton, which is the endoskeleton. The word endo means inside. Okay, so this skeleton is found inside the body of the organism. So this type of skeleton is found in the vertebrates. Vertebrates have backbone, right? And uh, there are five types of vertebrates here, five classes of vertebrates, which are, now remember the acronym FAMBI, eh? F is for what? Fish. A for amphibian, R for reptiles, M for mammals, and B is for birds, okay? Uh, so humans are in the category of mammals, okay? So we also have the endoskeleton, and endoskeleton each. So what is the an endoskeleton. It is a rigid internal skeleton, right? This is the skeleton of a frog, made up of cartilage and bone, all right? So uh, more of the skeleton is made up of the hard bone, but in certain parts like the ear, you can bend your ear, see you know, a bit, uh, the, the outer flap. And also in your nose, all right, there are, there's the cartilage tissue, which is slightly softer, not so rigid as bone, all right? And then, uh, so the skeleton consists of these uh, two materials, huh? the cart cartilage and the bone. And uh, there are soft tissues surrounding the bones of the cartilage. Okay, as seen in this picture of the arm, you can see that the upper muscle here is called the biceps, right? So it can, it can, it's a soft tissue and it's attached to the bones, huh? above and below it. So for movement, the skeletal muscles that are attached to the bones must contract. When they contract, they will pull, now in this case, uh, the, the biceps contracts, it will pull the bone below it that, is, that it's attached to. You pull it upwards so that we can bend our arms uh, at the elbow here. Okay, so skeletal muscles contract to pull and move the bones. Now what's the advantage of this uh, exoskeleton, sorry, endoskeleton? So advantage of endoskeleton is that the bone and cartilage in the skeleton can grow and be repaired. It can be repaired. So it can grow. You know, for example, if somebody breaks a bone, the bone can grow back and uh, or, or if there's a fracture, right? The bone can grow back the tissues and then the fracture can be repaired, right? So bone is a living tissue, unlike the exoskeleton in insects that is non-living, right? Bone has bone cells in them also, uh, cells that can grow. So uh, bone and, cartil and cartilage in the skeleton can be repaired. Uh, so that's an advantage. And then the skeleton is rigid, strong, and pro 
protects the internal organs like the the lungs and the heart are protected by the rib cage. The brain is protected by the skull, by the cranium, right? And so it provides strong support and enables locomotion. Uh, that is a can be very fast, okay? Quick locomotion and efficient locomotion, right? Now, by the way, is the snake does the snake have an endoskeleton or a hydrostatic skeleton? So although the snake looks like an earthworm in terms of its shape, cylindrical and long, it's not like the earthworm. Earthworm only has a hydrostatic skeleton, but the snake has a backbone, right? It is a reptile. So it has an endoskeleton inside its body. So for movement in animals with endoskeleton, let's just recap. The endoskeleton has many joints, which are the parts where the bones meet. Now, when the muscles attached to the bones contract, they'll pull the bones and then the limbs, like the arms or legs, will bend or straighten at the joints and movement occurs, right? So, for example, uh, when we want to bend the arm at the elbow joint, we're going to pull up the lower arm. This is what happens. First, the biceps muscle will contract and then it will pull the radius all right, the bone that the muscle is attached to, you pull the radius and the ulna also will follow so to both these uh, bones will move upwards. So the lower arm will be pulled upwards and the limb will bend at the joint, at the elbow joint. The arm will bend at the elbow joint, right? So there's movement really, a movement occurs to the arm. It moves upwards. Now let's discuss this question. Explain the necessity or importance or the role or the function of skeletal systems in animals and humans, five marks, okay? So generally, humans and animals need the, ex the skeletal system to enable them to move from place to place in search of food, partners or mates, and to escape from predators that want to eat them and also from other threats. Now, secondly, most multicellular organism organisms need support because of their soft body tissues inside the body, right? So the exoskeleton in insects and crabs help to support and protect the body organs. And with that, the animals will also be able to move more easily, right? Instead of being just a block of like amoeba-like uh, creature, right? Which cannot move well. Now, the hydrostatic skeleton of an earthworm, which has soft tissues, helps it to maintain a rigid body shape and then it also enables movement, right? Now, how about the endoskeleton of humans and also mammals? So the endoskeleton of humans functions to maintain body shape, support soft body tissues, enable a person to move. Other than that, it has some, uh, it also protects the internal organs from injury. For example, the rib cage protects the lungs and the heart. It helps to produce the blood cells, such as the red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells or leukocytes and the platelets in the center part of the of certain bones, like the firmer, right? And the humerus. So these have the bone marrow, the tissue in the center part of the bone that is reddish in color, red in color, and the blood cells are produced there, all right? It helps to store minerals such as calcium and phosphate in the bones. So in this diagram, we see the functions of the human skeletal system or the functions of the human skeleton, as we have mentioned just now. Here we see the organs protected by the ribcage. Now you can see the lungs. The liver is also a bit hidden uh, and protected by the ribcage, right? And then the pelvic girdle does support and protect internal organs like the uterus, the intestines, and so forth. Now, here we see the bone marrow. So the bone marrow contains uh, stem cells that are not specialized, but they can develop into blood cells like the red blood cells. These are all white blood cells and even the platelets. Right, that's all for this lesson. Thanks for viewing. Do share, like and subscribe. Goodbye for now.